On today's show, it's all about ocean acidification. So, ready to make a difference? Building a better planet starts with you. and welcome to another exciting episode of Aqua Kids. I'm Katie. And I'm Drew. Katie, today we have a busy day ahead of us. <laughs> Why is that, Drew? <laughs> what do we have on the schedule? Well, we've got an overview on climate change lined up, an experiment in the lab, a trip through the estuary, and finally, a touch tank with rays. Whoa, that is a very busy day. But wait, how do these all connect? Well, Katie, climate change and increased carbon in the atmosphere causes ocean acidification. Oh, I've got it, which impacts the wildlife in the estuary and the rays in the tank? Exactly. All right, well, I'm excited to learn more. Me too, let's go. Okay. We're here now at Bogue Sound. We're looking at the effects of climate change on an estuary environment. That's right, I think Drew and Danielle are getting some inside info right now. Let's go take a look. Okay. So Wendy, what are we doing today? So today we're gonna to talk about climate change and how it's affecting some habitats, specifically the marsh. But first we need to understand what is causing climate change. So we need to understand carbon. So every living thing contains carbon. Plants and animals contain carbon. When they die and go back to the earth, they become fossilized and that's how we get the term fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. Over millions of years, these fossil fuels form in the earth and then we extract them to use them for oil and gas and natural gas right. for human consumption, correct? Mm -hmm. right. All right, so what happens when we burn carbon is that it releases carbon dioxide. Now, carbon dioxide in and amongst itself is not bad, it's good. Plants need carbon dioxide, we need carbon dioxide. But what's happening today is that we're burning too much carbon dioxide. Right. What happens is carbon dioxide acts as a greenhouse gas. It gets trapped within the Earth's atmosphere. So you can think of it kind of like this. The Earth has a blanket around it of carbon dioxide. Now when the carbon dioxide is burned, it, some of it escapes into the atmosphere, but the rest of it gets trapped by this blanket around the Earth. And when that blanket gets thicker and thicker and thicker, everything underneath of that blanket gets warmer and warmer. Therefore, the Earth is warming up because we're burning more and more fossil fuels. So you've got sea levels rising and coral bleaching. How does all of this affect the ecosystem? Well, there's a lot of impacts and scientists are really just starting to understand what's gonna happen with these effects from climate change. So in this marsh right here, we're not exactly sure how sea levels are going to affect the plants and animal life here, but we do know that they will have to adapt and adapt very quickly in, if they want to survive. So sea level rise could be anywhere from 30 inches to three feet. Wow. Scientists really don't know. We're using modeling to try to understand, and a lot of it depends on geomorphology of the land. So we're just basing this on scientific predictions, and we're trying to adapt ourselves to be able to handle these sorts of impacts. So on the coast here, you can imagine if we had a three foot sea level rise, we would be standing in the water. <laughs> that would be pretty dramatic. Yikes. But we can't say for sure that that's what's going to happen, so we really need to prepare as best we can. And the best way that we can do that is by reducing our carbon footprint. So what is a carbon footprint? That's a great question. So a carbon footprint is actually how much electricity or energy an individual is consuming. So it's how much energy you're using in your home, in your cars, and even in things like plastic consumption because plastics are made from fossil fuels. So what we need to do as individuals is actually think about our carbon footprint and then do take actions to reduce that. Can we reverse the effect of the carbon footprint? Well, it's difficult to reverse your carbon footprint altogether because let's face it, we need energy to live. Yeah. But we can certainly reduce how much energy that we're using on a daily basis just by thinking about things, turning off the lights, closing the refrigerator door, and again, biking to your friend's house instead of getting your mom driving you over there. We're here now with Sam, who's gonna teach us all about ocean acidification. Ocean acidification is a problem that's affecting all of the oceans around the world. That's right, Clark. So Sam, tell us, what is really happening? 
All right, so what ocean acidification is, it's actually changing our carbon dioxide that's being absorbed into the ocean is actually changing our ocean's chemistry. Wow. Now what is happening um, is carbon dioxide is mainly produced by humans. So we breathe carbon dioxide, but that's not really the issue. The issue is more from transportation, industry, and electricity that's creating that carbon dioxide. Wow. Now carbon dioxide gets absorbed into the trees, and it also gets absorbed mostly into the ocean. So it gets absorbed into the ocean more than the trees absorb it? Yep, more than the trees. So about 93% of our carbon dioxide is actually absorbed right into our ocean. Wow. And what happens, though, is as more CO2 is absorbed into the ocean, the pH, pH level actually decreases or becomes more acidic. And so this is the problem here because it creates what we call carbonic acid. And carbonic acid is a major problem for most of our sea life. Um, the acidic seawater increases the acidity, and that carbonic acid actually dissolves or corrodes the shells um, of our sea life animals. Uh, it also makes it really hard for them to create that shell um, since that carbonic acid. Well, we've been talking about ocean acidification, but I don't think any of us really know what exactly it, it does. So is there any way we could get a closer look at it? Yeah, we'll step over to our lab and do a little lab work so you guys can get a little closer look at how ocean acidification is happening and how it's affecting some of our animals. Cool. Sounds like fun. <laughs> it's really scary to think that human actions such as burning fossil fuels are impacting the environment in such a large way. With coral bleaching, rising sea levels, increased temperatures, and ocean acidification, it's horrifying to think of what our Earth will look like in just a few years. That's right, Drew. Plants, animals, landscapes, and entire ecosystems are at risk. Although we can't do much to reverse global warming, Reducing our carbon footprint is one way we can really make a positive impact on our environment. Don't go away. When AquaKids comes back, we get to do a cool science experiment. Nice. AquaKids presents another AquaKids pop quiz. Aquatic animals are some of the oldest known species on Earth. Can you guess which one of these animals is the oldest? Is it A, the jellyfish, B, the sea sponge, or C, the Nautilus. Check the fossil record, and I'll be back with the answer after the break. Did you guess which one of the animals we mentioned has been around the longest? Even though it's not the oldest, the Nautilus has been around for about 500 million years, and jellyfish have been here for roughly 505 million years. But the great granddaddy of them all is the sea sponge. A recent fossil discovery of a sea sponge has been dated as being approximately 760 million years old. Welcome back to AquaKids. We're headed to the lab to conduct a really cool experiment on ocean acidification. <laughs> okay, let's go. So Sam, tell us what we're going to do here. Yeah, so we're going to take a closer look at pH, carbon dioxide, and how pH is affecting some of our shelled organisms. So what I have here and in front of you, you guys have what we call bromothymol blue, which is a pH indicator. So what we're going to do, we're going to pour um, our distilled water, which is a neutral uh, water or liquid into each of yours. Looks kind of green to me. Yep, yeah. and so what <laughs> it's supposed to be, uh, the neutral color will be green, and when we put an acid and a base in it, it should change colors. Oh. So if you guys can pour a little bit of your distilled water in there. Mm -hmm. Just pass it around, fill it up. And as you guys are doing that, I'll start up here. So I have uh, acid, a base, and our neutral, of course. So our acid is going to be our vinegar. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pour some of my vinegar in there, and as you guys can oh. see, it turns a bright yellow when it becomes an acid. So this is our base, or our neutral right there, and our base is going to be our baking soda. So when I put our baking soda in here, you guys can see it turns a dark blue color. All right, so what we're gonna do next, we are actually going to take these straws, put them in your cup, and we're gonna blow our carbon dioxide into your water. So what do you guys think, what color will it change? Will it be more of an acid or our base? Acid. Acid, very good. So we just learned earlier that carbon dioxide, when it's absorbed into the ocean, becomes more acidic. So it should turn this yellow color. So if you guys will take a straw, dunk it into your cup. Thank you. Pass it down. Thank you. And one more. And then if you guys blow bubbles into it, it should turn into this yellow color. Okay. All right. Nice. So Let's watch Clark first. Wow. <laughs> wow. 
So just a little bit of carbon dioxide. Yep, just a little bit into that small cup. So um, just like we mentioned earlier, 93% of our, or our carbon dioxide is actually stored into the ocean. So we can just see how that little bit of, I'm sure you didn't even use a whole breath of air to blow into it. That is how much it changed into an acid. Wow. wow. Okay, so we just saw that our carbon dioxide changes our water into an acid. So what I have here, we're going to pass these out. I have uh, an echinoderm, or what we call a sand dollar, is a type of echinoderm, and that uses calcium carbonate to build its shell. So we're going to put that little piece of our sand dollar into this cup, so you guys can pass that around, and then we're going to pour some of that vinegar in there, and what you'll see, you'll actually start to see it kind of bubble up. Um, so we can see how it slowly dissolves some of those shelled organisms. All right, so what we're gonna do next, we're going to take our vinegar and you guys are gonna pour it into there. Um, so cover it nicely. If we need more vinegar, we have that. Okay. And you should start to see it kind of bubble up. Let's not yet. See. Oh, oh. A couple of tiny bubbles. Yeah, it's not gonna be real fast, but you'll see some little yeah. bubbles. I hope you guys learned some new stuff that our carbon dioxide does turn our ocean waters into acid. And when we put acid onto our shelled organisms, that they actually start to dissolve and corrode. So when you guys go out into the estuary, take a look at some of those shelled animals and see if you can see any effects of ocean acidification. Yeah. Thank you. Drew, what did you think of that science experiment? I thought it was a great example of ocean acidification. We always talk about ocean acidification, but it's hard to actually see the effects. Yeah. The experiment really displayed how when carbon dioxide enters our water, it turns into an acid. I also thought it was interesting how you could literally see the sand dollar piece decaying when it was immersed in the acid. It's terrible to think that this actually goes on in our oceans, just on a much larger scale. Don't go away. Aqua Kids will be right back. Welcome back to Aqua Kids. We're now headed out into the estuary to see how all the animals that call the estuary their home are impacted by ocean acidification. Let's get started. All right, Aqua Kids, come on with me. We're going to cross across this mud flat and we're going to make our way out to the open estuary where we'll be able to do some, oh boy. some studies. Yeah, be careful. Be careful. <laughs> the mud's really thick in some areas, so just be careful and walk around this bank and you'll be fine. We've got a lot of mollusks and arthropods that we can discover out here today. Animals that are affected by a change in pH in our ocean's chemistry. Ooh. Starting to see some of these mollusks already. Check out, as y'all come across, you look across this green grass, the Spartana grass, in some areas here at low tide, we're seeing lots of these small little marsh periwinkle snails. These marsh periwinkles oh, yeah. are an Ooh. excellent example of some local mollusk that live here within our estuary. Here, a take mollusk? A, yeah, What's a mollusk? A mollusk is an um, animal that creates a shell. It's a soft-bodied invertebrate, and as it grows, its shell grows with it. Um, oh, wow. Compare that to another group of invertebrates, arthropods, which we're also seeing, some of the fiddler crabs here in the marsh mud. They, the um, as they grow, they actually shed their hard outer shell. So there's wow. two different phylums of marine invertebrates that we'll be seeing a lot of out here today. The mollusk, like the small snail, again, they grow a shell, but as their shell grow, as they grow, their shell grows with them. So we're already starting to find some marine life. Come on out, let's head to Bogue Sound and see what else we can find. All right, just be careful. We're almost out there now. We're gonna come across this oyster reef. I want you to remember that oysters have really, really sharp shells. So as we're moving around, just be cautious. Right here's one that you can take and pass back as we're walking along. Oysters are uh, another mollusk that we can talk a little bit about. They're really important animals as they filter oh boy, the water a, that we have. They're natural filters. It's a nice oyster. One oyster can filter over 50 gallons of water a day. So come on out towards Boak Sound. We're gonna do some clamming. We're gonna try to catch some uh, local clams. They're an important Ooh. seafood industry here in our area, and a lot of people like to, uh, to consume them. All right, everybody, we're gonna make our way out into Boak Sound. Wendy, we'll see you later. All right, have fun. Yes, Thank you. Come on out with me. We are going to teach you how to hunt for these clams, which are relatively simple animals to find, but I want to make sure I explain to you how we're going to use these clam rakes. Mind if I use yours real quick, Trent? All right, so what you're going to do is you're going to take the clam rake and you're going to place it down into this soft mud. You don't have to dig down too deep because the clams won't burrow deeper down than about a half an inch. You're just going to take it and gently pull it. As you're pulling it, you're digging into that soft mud and at some point, hopefully, you're going to feel the rake hit a hard spot. When you hit this hard spot, it'll just feel different and you'll actually hear it when it hits. And at that point, you're going to pull it in and dig it in a little bit deeper and hopefully you'll find a clam. Ooh. 
find something? I think I did. Oh, look at that. Well, hold on, let me see what you got. I don't know. Clam? You, yeah, you did indeed. You found one of our native quahog clams. This is a uh, clam species that's commonly found here in our estuary. Cool. They, uh, as you saw, weren't too down, down too deep. They uh, filter feed just like the oysters do. They can suck the uh, water into the opening of their shell through two small openings called siphons. Mm -hmm. And then they're able to filter that water and get their food and their oxygen from the water directly. Now this clam is named the Quahog because by the Native Americans who lived in our region, the Algonquian tribe specifically, named it the Quahog because that translates to me a hard, dark shell. Oh, here we go. I found some. Hey Wayne, I found some. What you got? I don't know, they look different though. This one's a little bigger, hey, a lot you've bigger. You've got a couple different size clams now. As we're measuring clams and we're talking about consumption, when you turn them over at the apex of the shell, where the shells can join together, mm -hmm. You can see that that one would be just legal size, a little over a half inch. Oh wow! So that would be the perfect size for a small clam for food. Now, as they get bigger, they're a little bit tougher. Mm -hmm. This one's a little is larger, would provide you with more meat, but would be a little bit tougher. So that one might be a chowder clam, whereas that one would be perfect uh, sauteed in some butter. Oh neat! Maybe wrapped in bacon. A lot of people like to consume <laughs> clams. They're an important seafood industry in our state. So what would happen if these animals were no longer able to create these shells because mm -hmm. of ocean acidification? Would they no longer be able to filter water? That's a great question. We're scientists are concerned that animals like this were um, in waters that are changing, which is happening on our planet right now, that they are affected mainly during their larval stage. When they first reproduce, they release uh, larval clams into the water, and at that point, they're very susceptible as they're growing and building shells. And right. scientists are concerned, they're already starting to see that these animals are not as effective at shell building as the chemistry of our ocean changes. So wow. it certainly uh, would not allow it to grow up and be an, an adult population that does as a natural filter. So it's an important thing that we're aware of what's happening in our oceans and with the changes in chemistry and how that's going to affect animals like this Quahog clam. I had a lot of fun going out into the estuary. Although it was muddy and kind of smelly, it was so cool to dig up those clams. There were so many different species living in the estuary, and although the effects of ocean acidification and global warming were not that present, it's scary to think that in just a few years, the pristine environment we were walking in could have clams with eroded shells and water levels up to our necks. It's really up to us to decrease our carbon footprints and prevent this from happening. If we all just make one change, we can protect all of those amazing species. That's right. Now we get a chance to feed some stingrays, an animal whose food supply is affected by ocean acidification. John, what do we have in this tank in front of us? Uh, we've got seven different species of stingrays, and we do a daily oh. feed for the stingrays, and today we're going to be feeding them clams. All right. Why clams? Uh, it's one of the natural foods for these guys. They'll also feed on uh, shrimp, uh, crabs, fish, and other mollusks, but clams is one of their favorite food to eat. They sift it out of the sand in the wild, and we chop it up and prep it for them here, make it a little bit easier for them. So before we start feeding them the clams, how do the different stingrays feed? Um, depending on the species, they feed in different ways. So a lot of the rays, like the yellows and the Atlantics and the Southerns, they just go around until they find food on the bottom, just like they would in the wild, and suck it up. The butterfly rays, they hide in the sand kind of like a flounder and they wait for a live food to come by. They come out and attack it. The cow nose rays, they feed on clams in the bottom. So what we're going to do is we're actually going to hand feed them some strips of clam today. They'll come up and they'll feed right out of our hands. Okay. So what we do is we hand feed the cow nose here at the aquarium to allow them to get more food and it also makes them used to people and more friendly for touch tank visitors. So what we do is we put a piece of clam in the water and once they smell it, they'll come around and approach it and then they'll feed on it. Oh my god. Oh, look at them all come. So you just wait until he pulls it out of your hand and then you feed him another piece. So I'm going to pass out some pieces of food to everyone. And you can take a strip. Ooh, gooey. And here you go, Trent. <laughs> Set two. And there you go. Thank and you. And basically just put it between your fingers and then put it under their mouth and then let them come by. So you can go ahead and put your hands in the water now. Okay. And then just wait for a cow nose to come by. Well, if their food supply is affected by acidification, what happens? Um, basically, if there's no food source for rays, uh, you'll have a decline in rays, and rays are a very important food source for sharks, so they would continue to affect the food chain, and we wouldn't want to lose sharks or one of our top predators. They also feed on a lot of sick and diseased animals in the ocean, um, so we definitely don't want to lose the rays and the sharks. Well, that's all the time we have for today's show, but at least we learned a lot about ocean acidification. Absolutely. I never knew that the burning of fossil fuels would actually make the oceans more acidic. I didn't either. It's so sad to think that in a matter of time, all of the shelled organisms living in the oceans and wetland areas will have difficulty surviving because of their eroding shells. And it's not only the clams that are affected. 
Because clams are at the bottom of the food chain, other animals such as rays and sharks could be impacted as well. And eventually, we'll also feel the effects of ocean acidification. Which is why we all need to take action. And remember that everyone can do their part to keep the planet green and blue. And so can you. So visit our website for cool eco tips. And fun links to show you how we can keep the world and the water a great place to play and explore. And we'll see you next time on, on Aqua Kids. Kids.